Thanks for joining our YouTube channel. If you haven't done so already, please click that subscribe button to join our community. That way you get notified each and every week a message pops up. With that being said, we pray that this message encourages and inspires you to take one step closer to Jesus. Hey, good morning, Risers. How are you guys doing this morning? Welcome, welcome. Super excited to be with you on this first Sunday of the new year. Everybody watching online, welcome. If you're new to our church, my name is Brent. I get the privilege of being your lead pastor, and we're going to continue to experience God together today uh, for the next few moments. Now, today is what we call the State of the Church Address. Uh, it's a different type of Sunday than a normal Sunday for us. Uh, today is really family talk. If, if you're uh, not part of our church, I think you'll still really enjoy uh, this message today, but, uh, but it's really geared towards our family as we celebrate what God did last year and look forward to the new year. And uh, in the middle of 2020 being a very chaotic year and a crazy year, and uh, obviously we could talk at length about the craziness of 2020. In fact, two weeks ago, we kind of did that. Uh, obviously, we could, we could talk like that. Um, but I want to look forward to and celebrate what God has done in 2020. Ken, can you figure out what that is and stop it? <laughs> Whatever it is, is driving me crazy behind my head. Um, and uh, so uh, we want to look, for, we want to celebrate what God did last year. So in the middle of a crazy year, um, do you realize that we had 263 decisions for Christ last year? Come on, y'all. And by the way, this is the Sunday that, uh, uh, that I unapologetically tell you, you should bang your hands together until they hurt. Like, like this is the Sunday we get to celebrate all those kind of things. Uh, in the middle of that, not only do we have decisions for Christ, we had at least 20 physical healings last year. Yep. I say we had at least 20 because we don't always do the best job of counting those kind of things. And, and I think it's probably higher than that, but we had at least 20 uh, that we know of. And I think that's really cool as we look at 2020 as well because uh, a significant part of the year we were not physically gathering. And then when we do come back to physically gather, we're not touching. Uh, and we didn't even have altar calls for like a long time and, and, and such until just recently did we even bring those back. And so I think that's a really cool thing to see how God still heals in, in the midst of that. So uh, as we uh, walk through 2020, we continue to grow. And we had 110 people uh, go, go through discovery class last year. Yep. <laughs> Last week, we started pushing groups for really kind of the first time ever, really trying to emphasize them towards the end of last year. Uh, and even though 2020, and even though um, it was the first time, we had 512 people attend a group last year. Yep. Yeah. Love that. Um, we talk about physical healings. There's a lot of emotional, spiritual, uh, inner healings that happen inside of people too. And oftentimes that happens through our Sozo ministry. And we had 63 people go through Sozo last year. Yep. And then people going to Healing House, coming with oftentimes larger physical ailments. Uh, coming to Healing House, we had 59 people go through Healing House last year. Yep. And in the middle of a year where a lot of people were financially strapped and it was a very difficult year uh, and a lot of insecurity when it comes to finances, uh, we gave away almost $139,000 uh, to Legacy Projects last year. Yeah. That's both locally and all around the world. Things like Elsa's House of Hope and different things like that that we still support and are a big part of and, and run. Um, uh, as well as uh, our local benevolence giving that really... It's almost entirely our church. We gave over $21,000 away in benevolence giving. Yeah. When you give to Arise, I love this because this is a lot of time it's single moms and people like that just trying to make ends meet, trying to get through the year, especially this year and everything that came against us this year. Uh, and, and you were helping keeping electricity on and, and just keeping life moving forward this year. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Over $21,000 given away um, uh, that way. Uh, obviously, we made a big transition back in March and went online. And when we went online, like basically every church in America, uh, we started emphasizing emphasizing the online stuff a lot more. We kind of transitioned from being a physical church with a digital expression to becoming a digital church with a physical expression. And we've tried to maintain that and try to keep pushing the digital because that's where people are at nowadays and that is the future. And so uh, as we were doing that, uh, we really didn't um, keep track of numbers very well prior to March. Uh, but since March, we've had over 100,000 views uh, from our church services. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, that's through all of our platforms on YouTube and Facebook and our website and Roku and all those different platforms that they're on. Uh, on top of that, what I thought was really neat is uh, somewhere along the line, I don't know, a few months into it, we started to realize views are not really what matter to us. That's not the most important thing uh, because we, it'd be like you coming in today and you're just listening and you're not engaging. And so we said, what are engagements? What are things like when they share, when they, when they like, when they post something, when they comment, when they give, when they actually take an action step, they do something, they engage. And we had over 44,000 engagements out of those 100,000 views. And I think that is even more valuable than the 100,000 views. And I love it that we have people literally around the world that watch us now. And uh, uh, some that were watching even before in different places. Um, but, but just recently we had somebody call from Texas that, that they said, you are our home church and we're watching you guys and we're giving to you. And, and I love how God is doing that uh, around the world and he continues to do that. So... Uh, 2020, we continued on with Operation Proliferation. Say, what in the world is that? Well, that's our five-year strategy to restore the church's position of significant influence as the center of our community through empowering incarnational risers, discipling community leaders, and developing solutions to the major needs of our community. Basically, Operation Proliferation is a, is a, a charge to get so involved in the community that the community would actually hurt if we didn't exist. And that has been a charge now for years. We've been doing it for, uh, this will be the fourth year, I believe. And uh, we've been doing that. And it's really seen a lot of fruit this year. As the world went through a shaking, we saw where political people, uh, community leaders of different types were calling us for counsel. They were calling us for prayer. All of a sudden, as the world was shaking, Jesus Christ and his church through a rise became a pillar inside the community that was secure and safe. And I think that is awesome. Yeah. Uh, within Operation Proliferation, there's so much that we could talk about that we can't all get to, but, uh, but we're involved in things like Echo and Choices and Hope for Her and Miracles Outreach, uh, the Angel Foundation with Liz Brewer, who's here, uh, part of our Rise Church family, and uh, we were actually able to walk, through five, or walk with five families through life-altering, catastrophic moments with her ministry, uh, uh, working with different schools like Mintz, Kingswood, Sesame, and Buckhorn, and sponsoring them and taking care of their needs. Uh, served in multiple businesses this year in different ways and through not only the Chamber of Commerce but through coaching different businesses as they walk through this time. I believe that the church should be that center of the community that people lean into and they go to, not run away from. And we've been a big help to a lot of businesses this year uh, through different coaching and things like that that go on. Uh, we were able to sponsor at least uh, over 70 kids this Christmas. Kind of came on last second uh, because of COVID. The, the schools weren't allowing uh, the angel tree and that stuff that we would normally do. And so last second, um, they said, hey, can you, can you take on these kids? And we said, absolutely. And so last second, we jumped in with that, uh, continuing to work with the Brandon Regional Hospital. Uh, as BHU closed down, we worked with them in the beginning of the year till it closed down out of Brandon, uh, but continuing to work with them. And really just seeing the impact of our church inside the community has been a beautiful thing as we continue to grow roots inside of this community and impact not uh, impact the movers and shakers, the influencers of our community. Amen. Um, uh, last year too, uh, it's, it seems like so long ago now, but it's only been a year. Uh, it seems like longer than a year, but we actually started to rise India last year. Yeah. <clears throat> Love our Arise India family. There's probably a few of you in this room right now. Love you guys. Uh, this uh, 9 o'clock service was translated into Malayalam uh, because of our relationship with our, our southern India folks there. Beautiful thing. Uh, I do think within the next few weeks, maybe a month or so, that we will have a new location for them too, which is beautiful. So keep praying with us for that. Uh, that'll be a very, very good thing for them. Yeah. Yeah. As we went online... Uh, we started to learn new things. We went online, and, and you know our church DNA. We are a creative church by our nature, meaning we're willing to try new things. And so we went online, and as we went online, we thought, you know, we can do better than just preaching, you know. And this is not a knock on other churches, but from the get-go, I said, all right, I'm not going to pretend that I'm in the church preaching and everybody's, you're watching in your living room, right? I'm not going to pretend like it's just normal. Let's just not do that. So if you remember, we immediately put a TV beside me and just started going that route. I went all Andy Stanley. And we did that for a few weeks. And then we kind of came up with this idea. We said, if we're going to make online content, 
why not really make online content? The joy, of, the joy of video is that you can do it anywhere. So why not start making messages that not only are a sermon, but they tell a story? And so we started cinematic messages last year, cinematic sermons. And uh, here's a few of them that we had done, you might recall, where we actually went on locations and let the backgrounds also be part of the story that we told. I know those were hugely possible, po- popular. How many of you liked those last year? No? Yeah. I know they were a lot of fun to make and, and very popular, and I think they do a better job of actually giving the message out. And, uh, and then that carried into even this year as we made cinematic uh, devotionals for Thanksgiving and then Christmas and then New Year's. How many of you watched me jump out of an airplane? If you didn't watch me jump out of an airplane, you need to do it because I jumped out of an airplane. People were like, why would you do that? Listen, there is nothing in me that wanted to do that. This was not like on my bucket list, and I'm like, one day I'm going to jump out. I was not interested in jumping out of an airplane. I tried to pass it off to other, every other staff pastor. Nobody else wanted to do it. They, they're laughing because they know it's true. I did it because I love you, and I think it makes a great devotional and a great message. And so I jumped out of an airplane, but that was part of these cinematic messages uh, that, were, that we did throughout the year. And we'll continue doing those. In fact, if you're here on first Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, you'll have another one, not the whole message, but there'll be a snippet of the teaching that will be the cinematic message style. And I think that's, a, I think that's something of the future. I think that's something other churches are copying us in the way that we're, we're getting that off the ground. Um, as well as uh, last year, we were able to finally get a podcast started beyond our own churches and got the Creating the Future podcast getting up and going. Uh, How many of you have downloaded that? That's the problem. More of you need to download that. Uh, It's actually been very successful. If you like leadership talks, if you like deep apologetic talks on different topics, uh, political talks on Christian topics, uh, on politics, uh, Creating the Future with Brent Simpson is a great podcast. Go get it. Download it. Right now, we are up to 19 countries that people have downloaded it from. So, you know, yeah, download the podcast. Go on iTunes, uh, Apple iTunes, or uh, uh, Spotify, anywhere that you download podcasts, you'll find it, basically. Uh, We were also able to lead the community this year in Pray 813. In the midst of everything going cattywampus and crazy, we said we need to get a prayer charge happening inside of our own community. And so we we were actually the first church and working with uh, many others by the time we were done, probably 50, 60 or more churches inside of Hillsborough County uh, that were praying at 8.13 a.m. and 8.13 p.m. and seeking the face of God. And then we came out of that with a little Pray 813 revival, which was a blast because we did not have a speaker. We said the whole Holy Spirit is our speaker, and as he speaks to us, we're just going to share, and it really made a beautiful, beautiful little revival that we had. That was a neat thing out of out of 2020 and a beautiful thing to celebrate, uh, as well as uh, I officially started my doctorate this year, yeah, this last year. I'm not sure if that's worth celebrating or not. It depends on the day for me. There are some days that I'm like, this is awesome. There's other days that I'm like, I hate this. Why am I doing this? Um, but in a few years, you can actually call me Dr. Brent or something like that uh, officially. Now, there's some people that do that already, and I'm not sure if they're joking or if it's prophetic or what, but uh, I'm not sure. Uh, but that got started uh, this year. And uh, maybe one of the most cool things, it's, it's not why we do what we do, but it is a very fun thing to celebrate in 2020, is we were named the 56th fastest growing church in America and the fourth fastest growing Assembly of God church. <clears throat> yeah. Now, just so we're clear, that's not why we do what we do. We're not about trying to make ourselves higher on these lists and stuff like that. But when you consider that there's three to 400,000 churches in the United States, to be number 56 is pretty, pretty cool. And, uh, and I think that's a neat honor to have and to celebrate. And, uh, you know, and there's, there's thousands and thousands of Assembly of God churches, and we're the fourth fastest a grow, uh, growing Assembly of God Church. Uh, and in the midst of all of this, it's beautiful just to look around at what God is doing and say we are a beautiful New Testament body of Christ. We're a beautiful New Testament church. It's really a, a beautiful thing as you look around and you see different ages. you got old people. Now, if I said old people, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking to the older, older old person. But we got old people and young people all together. You got people of different social classes, different races and ethnicities, different languages that they speak, different backgrounds. You got rednecks and city boys all in the same room. You got all of these people coming together in unity, and it's incredibly beautiful. And I don't know if you'd know this. If you've been at our church for a long time, you you may not. Uh, That's not normal. It's not normal that you get all of this diversity coming together around unity around Jesus Christ. 
You know, that's what university means, unity out of diversity, unity among diversity. And all of that diversity coming together around Jesus Christ, and it makes a beautiful New Testament church. And somebody came to our church years ago, and they, they went to Pastor Tina, and they said, they, they, they said, listen, your church seems too good to be true. This just can't be good. This can't be real. Tell us what's wrong with your church. <laughs> Pastor Tina was like, listen, I, if, if you're looking for something wrong, you'll probably find it, but I don't think there's any glaring thing. And I think that's a beautiful testament of our church, that by no means are we perfect by any means. In fact, if you ever find the perfect church, you shouldn't go there because you would spoil it. That's a whole other message. So we're not a perfect church by any means, but it is beautiful to watch what God is doing in our midst and watch as God attracts different people from all races and backgrounds. And we don't see uh, fighting or gossip or ugliness within us. We don't even allow gossip in our church. That's the number one thing that we, we kill uh, out as fast as we can. And we just don't allow those things. And so we have this tremendous amount of unity. And, uh, and it's a beautiful movement that God has started here at Arise. So that's the year in review in the middle of a terrible, harsh 2020 in the world, in the United States, in the middle of everything going wrong. God is still faithful. God is still faithful. So I ask this question that I ask every year. This is a very important question. I think it's a prophetic question. I think it's important. Are we going to stay and live in the past Or are we ready to move forward into 2021? Because I do know people that are still living in what God did 20 years ago. You probably know some of the same people. Give me that old time religion with sawdust on the floor and those hymns they sung. And and that's a beautiful moment. But if you stay there, you never enter the future. So are you ready to move into what God wants to do in 2021? To move forward. Yeah. Amen. Okay. Okay. Well, as we move into 2021, I will say that good is the enemy of great. Good oftentimes will keep us from greatness. When we get satisfied with things being good, we're never going to step into the great things because we're happy with what once was. As often as I can right now, I'm going to use Tom Brady. We have him in Tampa Bay for two whole seasons, so I've got to use him as often as I can. Pastor Joshua keeps making fun of me about this. Uh, But he is the greatest quarterback of all times. And last year, or I'm sorry, not last year, last week, he, at 43 years old, threw for more touchdowns, I'm sorry, more yards in the first half than any player in the history of the NFL. He broke the Tampa Bay record for the most touchdowns ever in a season, and he still has a a game left to play, and he didn't even finish out the last game. So he's breaking these records. If you count it by a six quarter, if you count the last two quarters of the previous game and the first two of the last game, is actually the greatest four quarters in the history of the NFL by any quarterback ever. And he's 43 years old. I'm 43 years old. I also throw things. I throw my back out. How does he become the greatest of all time? What kind of mindset does a Tom Brady have? Well, I found this to be interesting uh, as I was watching the post-game interview last week uh, after the game, and they asked him about the playoffs. And when they asked him, this is what he said about the playoffs. He said, there's going to be a bunch of teams that make it this year, but there's going to be one team that ends up happy. So the more time we spend in proving as a team and improvement as a quarterback that I need to do, then the better it is for us. Tom Brady, the greatest of all time, who owns like every record, is still concerned with getting better, still concerned with improving. Listen, we can never be a church that gets satisfied on what we have done. We have to keep pushing, keep striving, keep moving forward, keep improving, because we are not perfect and we are not all that God has for us yet until this time. And so we keep pressing forward. We keep striving forward. And I believe that as we move into 2021, that God wants to develop some resilient disciples who are able to take a licking and keep on ticking, who are able to step into hard times and difficult seasons and not just survive, but actually thrive. I believe that God wants to develop extremophile disciples. 
As soon as I say that word, everybody's making funny faces at me. Maybe you've read it on a t-shirt already this morning. Maybe here or there you've seen it. But an extremophile is an organism that thrives amidst extreme circumstances. Extremophile literally means extreme, which is extreme, and ophile meaning lover. Lover, extreme lover. They love extreme conditions. That they don't just run from hard times, they actually run into hard times, and in the middle of the hard times, they actually change everything around them in order to succeed and not just survive. God wants to develop some extreme disciples, extremophile disciples in 2021. But don't just take my word for it. Watch this short 90-second National Geographic video uh, breaking down what an extremophile is. acidity and radioactivity. These harsh environments don't seem hospitable for life, but some organisms not only survive, but thrive under such extreme conditions. The name extremophile means extreme lover. These organisms live in exceptionally harsh environments, such as hot hydrothermal vents or buried in rocks far beneath the Earth's surface. Extremophiles occur in all three domains of life, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryote. They range from the extreme heat-loving thermophiles, which feed off of inorganic chemicals and have special enzymes to survive high temperatures, to extreme cold-loving psychrophiles, which have evolved antifreeze proteins that help ensure their survival in some of the coldest waters on the planet. But the most extreme living things on Earth are tardigrades. Also known as water bears, these water-dwelling micro-animals are polyextremophiles. This means they are capable of surviving multiple harsh conditions. They are nearly indestructible and have even survived the extreme conditions of outer space. Tardigrades have a unique adaptation that allows them to curl up into a dry, seemingly lifeless ball and slow down their metabolic rate. In this state, they can survive cold, dry environments like space for decades. Extremophiles. There's always been different extremophiles throughout life, throughout history. There are people that survive under the most adverse circumstances, but not only survive, they actually thrive amongst the most difficult circumstances. There's always been uh, groups that the men that in the middle of a battle, they rise up and they thrive while the gunfire is blazing around them that we celebrate and turned into heroes. Uh, tribes within the uh, mountains and in the most extreme deadly conditions of Eskimos and people like that that actually thrive amidst conditions that most of us would run from. There's always been these groups and even people that, that rise from the ashes of a broken life, people like Ben Carson that come out of it to become something great in the future. Now, within the Bible, there are tons of examples of extremophiles, probably way more than I could ever share. I'll share a bunch in a minute. But maybe the most obvious example of extremophiles actually is the exiles from Judah that are now being taken into captivity in Babylon. Now, you're going to have to forgive me because I'm going to jump around in these stories, and I'm going to assume that you know parts of these stories. But I want, to, I want to kind of tell the story through the big pictures and some moments that I want you to see. Because these extremophiles were exiles in Babylon. These exiles were extremophiles as they're taken by Nebuchadnezzar and forced into a whole new lifestyle style and indoctrinated into the Babylonian or Chaldean culture. In fact, uh, this Babylon created an extreme condition for their culture. All of a sudden, their culture was not going to be allowed to last. You can't be a follower of Yahweh and be in Babylon, especially in leadership, as we want to indoctrinate these young men and make them into something. And so, in verse 4 of Daniel 1, it says he was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. Because the first thing you got to do if you're going to indoctrinate somebody is teach them how to talk like you. So I need you to talk like me so you don't stand out, so that you can fit in. So leave that old Hebrew mindset. Leave that old Hebrew way of speaking. And now I want you to learn this new Chaldean language so you can speak like me. And I want you to learn our literature, our philosophy, our religion, our science. I want you to learn our way of thinking so you can be indoctrinated and brainwashed into this new way. Leave all that chaotic, silly Hebrew mindset behind you in Judah because now we're going to teach you the truth. 
And so these extreme conditions surround them. This says you're not going to be what you used to be. And, and this had to be so tempting for these young men. Judah had nothing. Judah was going through hard times. And they step into Babylon with their hanging gardens. And, and, and literally one of the seven wonders of the ancient world was there. And their amazing buildings and architecture. And it certainly made sense that the Babylonian gods were real and the Hebrew god was not. And so this whole environment created an extreme condition for their culture. This created an extreme condition to their principles. All of a sudden, they step into this, this moment, and they, they get there into Babylon. And as a way of indoctrination, the king says, listen, you can have any of the food from my table. The very best of the best food. I mean, it was like Moreno's with Outback, with those Cheddar Bay biscuits from Red Lobster. Come on, y'all. And it was all fat-free. I mean, it was like everything that you could ever dream of, and they put it all right there before in front of them. The problem with it was that most of the food and the wine that they were bringing had been sacrificed to idols. And so the king assigned them this daily amount of food and wine from the king's tables. And all of a sudden, their principles, what they believed, was all of a sudden confronted by these conditions of extremity. And it's hard. And What decision will I make? Will I waver this way or that way? What should I do? And this whole culture is fighting against them. You don't need to do this. Babylon created an extreme culture towards their identity. They, as soon as they get there, they start changing their names. They take away their, their Jewish names, their beautiful Hebraic names that celebrated who God was. And they start giving them new names in verse 6 and 7. Listen, go to the next slide. Daniel, they give the Daniel meant God as judge, but they renamed him Belshazzar, meaning Bell will protect. This wasn't just a name, this was your identity. So from now on, we're calling you by a new name, representing our God, not yours. From Hananiah meant God is gracious. They renamed him to Shadrach, which meant inspired by a coup, or the moon deity. Azariah meant God is my help, but they renamed him Abednego, servant of Nebu. Or Venus God. Mishael meant who is like God, but they renamed him Meshach, who is like a coup. Did you see this? They're, they're reorganizing the way they think around a new idea and a new concept. They're literally creating these extreme, extreme circumstances that most of us would bend to. That most of us, if we're honest, would, would fall down and lie down before and just receive it. At the very best, most of us would say, I just have to survive this. But as we're about to see, these exiles were not interested in surviving. They were interested in thriving. And these exiles, all of a sudden, these, these Hebrew extremophiles thrive where others could barely survive. Because as it starts out right from the beginning, you see that they say no to the king's food. That's a tough decision. There are some of you that went vegan this year, and I think you're crazy. But I love you because that means there's more meat for me. So I hope all of you go vegan. <laughs> I know it's better for the whole world. I'll live on you. Know. Okay. And so they, they, they said no to the king's food. And they said, we'll go vegan essentially. They said, give us fruits and vegetables and water instead. And test it for 10 days and just see what happens. And listen to what happens. Verse 15 through 20, at the end of 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief officials presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, listen, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in the whole kingdom. These guys weren't interested in surviving. They were interested in thriving. They weren't interested in just making it through this exile, just making it through this time. They were interested in thriving in the middle of it. And they found that that began to be the way it happened. Can I just say that we are extremophiles in a new Babylon? We are 
extremophiles in a new Babylon. In fact, one of the expressions that gets used for our culture sometimes is a digital Babylon. Because inside of your digital uh, device in your pocket or in your purse or beside you or sitting on your lap right now, in that digital device is every temptation that you could ever desire right at your fingertips. You are living in a new age, a digital Babylon, with every temptation of this world crowding around you, trying to form you into the image of this world and take away the image of Christ in you. We are extremophiles in a new Babylon. If you haven't caught on to it yet, I'll keep saying this and eventually you will. We are not in a Christian America any longer. Don't mourn over it. Don't freak out over it. Just keep moving forward with it. Because God was not that interested in a Christian America. He's more interested in a Christian people in America. Let that sink in. And so in the middle of this, this, this exile, we find ourselves in a similar place. You know, cultural anthropologists talk about first culture and second culture and third culture and even a fourth that seems to be almost on the horizon now that nobody even knows where it's going. First culture was pre-Christian. Second culture was Christian or at least deistic. Changed the whole world and for a long time the world looked at everything through a certain lens. Now we've stepped into a third culture that is now post-Christian. We live in a post-Christian America where the conditions are extreme for trying to expel your faith from you. Everywhere you look, they're going to try to take and are trying to take your faith away from you. Just try to say Christmas to the wrong person. The cancel culture that we're a part of right now. That if you don't agree and tip the line with everybody else, you can be canceled. We live in this world that has created extreme conditions to you actually being a true Christian. Now, as long as you're a Christian who keeps it in the right context, as long as your Christianity doesn't affect you or affect anybody else, and it's just like this little thing you do on the side, nobody cares. But if you're actually going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, and it's actually going to affect your life, the world has, has nothing of that. I'm reminded of Richard Dawkins, probably the most famous atheist in the world, also a famous zoologist, written many, many books who said in an interview that he doesn't actually want to dis exterminate Christians, he just wants to put them in zoos. Just like you see an animal in a zoo and you celebrate the animal because you only have a few of them left so you can learn from that animal and then you move on. Well, I don't want to actually exterminate Christians. I just want them to be so few and far between that we can look at them and go, oh, that's funny, let's move on, go to the next one. That's the world that we're living in right now. It is hostile to your faith. Therefore, we need extremophiles. Like the Hebrew extremophiles in Babylon, you can expect our new Babylon to create extreme conditions toward your faith. You are being brainwashed whether you realize it right now or not. This is why you're going to continue to hear me say this over and over. Stop watching so much of the news. You're being brainwashed whether you realize it or not. You're being taught how to live in fear. You're being taught how to live in a focused on everything nationally and globally instead of focusing on the Lord. And our culture creates this new Babylon. So we need extremophile disciples. We need resist, resilient disciples. One of my favorite scriptures in all of the Bible is Daniel 1.8. When he's tempted with all of this food, what is he going to do? Is he going to eat it all? Because that's what I would be awfully tempted to do. I think my belly is my God sometimes. That's why fasting is so important to me. <laughs> I have to kill that devil. Daniel 1.8, he says, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief officials for permission to not to defile himself in this way. He respectfully asked not to defile himself in this way. See, we have to develop convictions. We, we have to develop spiritual disciplines that lead us to a level of faithfulness that doesn't matter what everybody else in the world does, we are going to choose to be faithful to what God has called us to. And this led to an extremophile life that not only survived the exile, but thrived in the exile. We just celebrated the Christmas story. 
You know the magi that came to follow, that came to find Jesus? Most people believe that hundreds of years before, those magi were started by Daniel, who had written down the prophecies about the Christ. In all those years, this Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and even Ezekiel, he's one of the exiles as well, were not interested in just surviving this time. They were going to thrive. They were going to thrive. And you see this thriving happen over and over and over. <coughs> you see how their commitment to faithfulness to God actually led towards revival and moments where God was put on the throne of people's hearts. So, so what are you talking about? So there's, there's two more Two, two kind of big stories in the book of Daniel that even if you're not a Christian, even if you didn't grow up in church, you've probably heard these stories. The first one we refer to as the, the fiery furnace. And the first one, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel's probably out of the country. He's a dignitary at this point. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are told that if you do not bow down to this idol when the music plays, we are going to throw you into a hot stove, a fiery furnace. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is like, that's all well and good. I don't think I'm going to bow down though. And so they don't bow down. Nebuchadnezzar is furious with them. He is mad at them. And he throws them into the fiery furnace. He throws them in. And after he throws them in, he looks and he said, didn't we throw three in? I see a fourth man. And the fourth looks like one of the sons of the gods. Who is that fourth man? And so he hollers to them, come out. And then listen to what he said afterwards. Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other god can save in this way. This is a man who thought he was God. When their hope and their trust was in Jehovah, when their hope and trust was in God, not the nation, not the circumstances, not the right person being in a political office, when their hope and trust was in God, they started to influence everybody else. When they were faithful to what God had done, what God had said, all of a sudden they went from surviving to thriving The other big story in Daniel with the exiles that you hear about is the story of Daniel in the lion's den, right? We all told our kids this one. It's a beautiful kid story because you just picture Daniel laying there and, you know, purring on the, on the, you know, and he's just laying there like a pillow. It's a big lion pillow and, you know, he's got his hand all cuddled up in the lion. You know. And that one goes like this. He, Daniel was so successful that the haters came out. You know they come out. And they could not stand it that this Hebrew kid was thriving in their land and he's not supposed to be allowed to do this. So they had to come up with something to get him. So they tricked King Darius, that's the king at this point, they tricked King Darius into making a law that says everybody has to pray uh, to you and to our gods. Nobody can pray to any other god. And if they do, they should be thrown into a lion's den. Darius doesn't seem to know what's going on. He said, hey, that sounds like a good law. Throw that law into place. And then all of a sudden, Daniel is found out that he's prayed. They take Daniel, throw him in the lion's den. Lion's den. Uh, King Darius is actually upset about this. You ever say something stupid out of your mouth and then you have to pay the consequences later? That's King Darius in this moment. So Darius doesn't want to do it, but he has to do it because he said he would. And so he throws Daniel into the lion's den. And he comes back the next morning hoping that he's still going to be alive. And he comes back in the next morning and listen to what he says after he finds Daniel alive. Then King Darius, this man who thought he was a god, this man who he was the man. Then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of the kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He almost sounds like he's a theologian. <laughs> he rescues and he saves he performed signs and wonders in the heaven and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. <laughs> who said that? Oh, that was Abraham, right? This man who walked with God and talked with God. That was, that was Moses, right? That was none of them. That was a carnal king 
who had no relationship with God, didn't want a relationship with God, that was so inspired by Daniel's incredible faith and tenacity, his extremophile lifestyle, he was so inspired that he made a decree that everybody needs to pay attention to this dude. Ooh. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Daniel prospered. I'm so sick of people talking about 2020 and going, I'm just glad it's over. I just survived 2020. I understand where that's coming from, but I am not interested in surviving. I am interested in thriving. If you focus on everything wrong, you will focus on surviving 2020. But if you focus on the Lord, this was not a surprise. Nothing caught him off guard. He still knows the end from the beginning. He is the God who is always thriving. He is still on the throne. Therefore, I don't need to freak out over 2020. I focus on him. And I find myself thriving where other people are simply trying to survive. And here's the thing. Disciples of Christ have always been extremophiles. This has always been the case. Read virtually any story in the Bible going back to the beginning and you find this out. Abraham was called out of comfort into an extreme relationship with God. To walk with God and, and find this, this mythical God that he didn't understand at all. He's extremophile in the way he followed him. Joseph is a stranger in a strange land as he's trying to follow God. Moses is in exile. He's in this extreme condition when he finds God. All of the judges, including people like Gideon and Samson and Deborah, all of them rose to power in extreme times where the gospel and the, and the idea of God was being pushed out of the land and they were to call people back. David is rising to king during an extreme time where the king who's in office is trying to kill him. John the Baptist, we, we could go on and on, go into the New Testament. John the Baptist was so extreme that he ate locusts and honey and wore camel skin. He was an extremophile if there ever was one. Peter and the disciples would face constant threats of martyrdom. Paul would be shipwrecked and stoned and beaten to death. Paul would exp have incredible difficulties against him. Every one of the prophets of the Old Testament Elijah and all these different people that we celebrate were all extremophiles where the pressure of the culture was crushing God out of the culture and they would rise up and call people back to God. Every one of them are extremophiles. The early church for the first 300 years of the church, the early church was in constant threat of persecution and difficulty, martyrdom, losing your job, losing your livelihood, and yet they turned the world upside down. You know, where the, you know where the most successful church of Jesus Christ right now on the planet Earth is? China. In the most extreme conditions, where their backs are up against the wall, where they have to hide their churches, where they have to sneak around and not tell people, where they have to create seminaries that, that look like hotels and other places and, and, and fake it so that they can, they can hold these meetings together. That's actually where the church is growing the most rapidly with the most power, with the most authority, with the most miracles and signs and wonders. See, the church has always been extremophiles. I've said this before and I'll keep saying it again, but the church popular is the church polluted and when the church is polluted, the church is puny. The worst thing that happens to the church is when we become popular. We all want it because it makes life easier, but as soon as life gets easier, we find ourselves wandering away from God. And so the church popular becomes the church polluted, and the church polluted becomes a puny church. However, the church persecuted is the church pure. And when the church is pure, the church becomes powerful. It's not that I want hard times to come, but we need hard times to come to find out who we really are. We are extremophiles, that we thrive during the hard times. Why are we extremophiles? Because we are made in the image of an extremophile. <laughs> we are extremophile because Christ was an extremophile. There is no greater example of an extremophile than the one who was beaten with a cat of nine tails, put a crown of thorns on his head, forced to carry his cross, hung on a cross, died and was buried. It was over. It was extreme. Everybody else said it's done. Three days later, he arises, not little, he triumphantly, thriving, steps out of the tomb. <coughs> 
The same spirit that lived in Christ and raised him from the dead lives in you. You are an extremophile because you were made in the image of an extremophile. That's what Christianity is. Stop trying to survive when God's called you to thrive. Oh, we are extremophiles, extreme lovers, extreme lovers of God, extreme lovers of our fellow man, extremophiles who will live out the most difficult places and find ourselves, if we are faithful and focused on God, thriving, not just surviving. Thriving, not just surviving. I am an extremophile. Say it with me. I'm an extremophile. Come on, say it. I'm an extremophile. I'm not interested in surviving. I want to thrive. I'm not interested in getting through 2021. I'm interested in creating disciplines and principles that help me thrive in 2021. I'm interested in creating the future, not letting the future create me. I'm interested in being part of a movement that God has for us. So where did this come from? What do we need to learn? How do we become extremophiles? Going back to those three big stories, the reason for their success and ours is their commitment, their resolve, their focus on the right things. In the beginning, when they're tempted by the food, how do they respond in Daniel 1.8, the, the, the easiest temptation first? Daniel 1.8 says, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food. He resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. That was the first easy temptation. But listen to the harder ones, because it got a little harder after that. The next one comes when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are standing before the most powerful man on the planet who is threatening to throw them into a burning fire. Of all the ways to die, that's not high on my list. Jumping out of an airplane, maybe. Not as high. And so, he's standing there. They're standing there. And listen to how they respond. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. I love verse 18. But even if he does not. I believe I'm an extremophile. But even if this culture kills me, I'm still not going to change. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty. I love how they're still respectful. We want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Do you see this conviction? Do you see what's making them successful? What's allowing them to thrive is a conviction that's not going to change no matter how extreme the conditions try to force it to. And then you see it in the Daniel and the lions, and this is one of my favorites. We, we usually skim right over this verse. I just love it. So Daniel, here's the report. If you pray to anybody else, then you're going to be thrown into the den of lions. So Daniel, here's the report. Verse 10 of chapter 6. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went and cried and weeped and got all sad and thought, my life's over. He thought, I'll hide and I'll still pray, but I'll do it in a way that nobody can see me. Says he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem with the windows open for everybody to hear. <laughs> Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God. Big key moment. Just as he had done before. You cannot develop convictions in the moment you need the conviction. Your convictions have to be developed before you need them. 2021 for you and I is a year of developing convictions so that when the hard times come, whenever they come against you, these convictions are already there. These convictions like you just read about from Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these convictions are already there that allow you to thrive, not just survive, that allow you to be everything that God wants you to be. Do you see in these convictions their hope, their trust is not in the king or in our case, the president. It is not in a political system. It is not in the nation. They're not even in their nation. Listen, you are not in God's nation any longer. 
God's nation is the kingdom of God. You live in the United States of America. We need to bring the kingdom into the United States, but don't try to bring the United States in the kingdom. Stop losing your mind. If this person becomes president, the world's over. If this person does, the world's over. Stop it. Stop. Stop. Jesus is Lord. God is on the throne. He has not relinquished it yet. Stop watching the news to the point that you're being brainwashed. (laughs) Stop watching the news to the point that your mind is being manipulated by a culture. That's why we're digging deep into the word of God in January and hopefully creating disciplines that go further. So that your mind will start to be developed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, not everything else. And as it does, you will stand out like a city on a hill, like Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego, who are thriving in the midst of a culture where others are just trying to survive. God has called us to be extremophiles. Extremophiles. And I wrap up with this little question. It's an honest question that you may have never considered. But where did these boys learn this? Where did these young leaders, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and and again, you could use Ezekiel as well. Where did they learn this from? Where did they develop these deep convictions from? I mean, it's kind of weird. They came from a country that, that, that throughout at least portions of their life had, had wandered away from God. They were not strong in their faith there. God had destroyed Judah. Israel had already been destroyed at this point. God takes away Judah from the Israelites because of their lack of repentance and lack of following him. So where did they learn these convictions from? Well, if you go back a few more years, there's a king who rises to power. A king by the name of Josiah. Maybe you've heard of Josiah. He was the young boy. He was just a kid. Becomes king. At some point in his tenure as king, he finds the book of the law. This Nobody knows for sure, but probably Leviticus or Deuteronomy. He finds the book of the law hidden in the temple and reads it and realizes how far we've walked away from God. And he leads the nation in repentance and turning back to God. He leads them in this moment of turning back to God. And, and this question arises among theology students. Was Josiah successful? At this point, God had already decreed that Judah would be destroyed. Josiah could not change that. So therefore, in one hand, it looked like Josiah's reformation really wasn't successful. It didn't work. Until, until you start to do the chronology. And you realize that during the heyday of Josiah, there were some young, impressionable Hebrew boys, all about the same age, somewhere around 12, 13, 14, Named Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, that's what we know him as, and Ezekiel. Who were going to be so touched by the reform of Josiah that their lives would forever be changed. They were going to be so encountered by God that even when they walked into exile and everything was against them, they would not abandon it. What are you talking about, Brent? There are some of us in this room that if you're honest, you're thinking, well, things aren't that bad right now. I can see where it's going. I can see where the, you know, the difficulties, the persecution towards Christianity is coming. I can see it, but it's not that bad right now. But what if, what if you are a Josiah who is raising up Daniel's, Shadrach's, Meshach's, Abednego's, Ezekiel's? What if the disciplines that you are creating aren't really even about you, they're about your kids or your grandkids? What if what we are starting in 2021 in your spiritual disciplines that not only form you but form the generation behind you allows them to thrive amidst the difficult circumstances that I believe are coming inside of our nation? What if it's not even about you? What if Josiah's reform wasn't even about Josiah? What if it was about those four or five young Hebrew boys that were so touched during that time, that were so moved and so disciplined during that time that they would never lose that discipline even amidst the harshest of conditions. This may be bigger than you. This may be bigger than you. 
In 2021, we are committed to developing disciplines. It's not sexy. I wish there was a way to make it more exciting. Last week, if you didn't listen to the message, go back and find it because you really should. I explained a lot of things. But last week, I spent a lot of time to really say, read your Bible. It's not sexy, but it'll change you. And so last month, we started reading your Bible. Or or January 1st, we started reading your Bible. How many of you read the Bible every day so far? You're three days in? Good job. Good job. Tomorrow will be four. Each day, just read. Just read. First Wednesday is coming this Wednesday. We're starting first Wednesday services in the new year where we're going to celebrate and talk about those disciplines that God's calling us to, as well as baptisms and other testimonies and things we'll do. But make sure you're here Wednesday night at 7 o'clock for first Wednesday. We're going to have our first apologetics conference this year. That's an exciting thing that will come up a little later in the year. Why? Because we're trying to discipline you. We're trying to teach ourselves. We're trying to get to the place that we affect the world. The world doesn't affect us. We're trying to get to the place that we're not surviving America. We're thriving in America because our God is always thriving. Yeah. Would you stand up with me around the room? Hmm. Ezekiel would be so touched by Josiah's reform that he would look at a valley of dry bones and say, rise. Such an extremophile that things that were dead are going to come back to life. Some of you are in this room, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you are dead right now. And you know it because you feel it. And God is calling you to come back to life. Calling you to an extremophile relationship. Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes for one moment? If that's you in this room, and you say, Pastor, I need to give my life to Christ. I want to pray over you. I'm not going to call you out or anything. I just want to pray over you. But if that's you in this room, would you just stick your hand up and wave it at me so I can pray with you? Amen. 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 Come on, pray with me around this room. Say, Jesus, I need you. From this day forward, I surrender my life completely to you. I give you all of me. And I will follow you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, come on. If you just gave your life to Christ, do me a favor and make sure you tell somebody about that. Somebody who brought you, come see one of the prayer team here in a second. Uh, If you just gave your life to Christ, do me a favor, text Jesus to 21777. We have a great 21-day devotional we'd love to give you and walk you on this new journey of faith. I'm going to invite our prayer team to go ahead and come on up front and our communion team as well. We have communion this morning, right? Communion team as well. And we're going to sing one last song. And as we do, I'm going to invite you out of your seats to come on up front if you would like special prayer for anything. If you'd like to receive communion this morning, I invite you out of your seat and to the communion tables on my right and left. And we'd love to officiate communion with you this morning as well. And as we sing this last song and get ready to close, don't leave. We're going to have somebody else come up and close this out in just a second. But as we sing this last song, my challenge for you is that we become extremophile disciples. Because that's what it's going to take. That's what the remnant has always been. That's what the Christian experience has always been. That we will be people that are thriving amidst the most difficult circumstances. No matter what life throws at me, I will focus myself on the Lord and I will find peace and prosperity through Him no matter what life has thrown at me. Because God has called us to be extremophiles. Organisms that thrive amidst the most adverse circumstances. Come on, Pastor Jason, let's worship. If you want special prayer, we invite you out of your seat. Come on up front. We want to agree with you in prayer or communion. Thank you for watching this message today. We ask that you hit the subscribe button and share this message on all social platforms. Man, we are hoping that you were encouraged and blessed by what you heard. And we cannot wait to see you next time.